Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. Courts of law play an important role in enabling people to interact voluntarily with each other in society when disputes inevitably arise. Through television, movies, books, and jury duty, most people are pr pretty well aware of the role that litigation plays in our society. But less recognized and understood is another means of resolving disputes, and that's arbitration. How does arbitration work, and what are its advantages, and what are some of the criticisms that people have of the arbitration process? Joining me on eConversations today to talk about arbitration is Laura Dove, a professor of business law here at Troy University. Welcome back to the show, Laura. And hopefully we won't have any disputes between us that are going to need arbitration today. Oh, thank you very much, Dan, and I hope so as well. Well, let's get started here, because like, you know, arbitration in some ways is a substitute or a parallel for litigation and what we see through courts, but it's also different as well, right? Sure. So arbitration is um, just a form of alternative dispute resolution, or ADR. Uh, so basically that just refers to any manner in which um, disputes are resolved outside of the litigation system or the court system. Mm -hmm. And so what types of, uh, is, although it's uh, probably less uh, familiar than litigation, uh, one of the areas where I mean, maybe our, our viewers have heard of it before is, is uh, from the, the world of baseball, because uh, baseball players who aren't eligible for uh, free agency but have a, a contract negotiation with their uh, clubs can sometimes go to arbitration. And so that might be you know, the, the most familiar, most visible example of arbitration. But this actually tells us a little bit about the, the circumstances in which we see arbitration arise, right? Sure. So just like, um, like you said, sports fans know, um, baseball players often have contracts that require salary disputes to be resolved through arbitration. And a lot of employment contracts contain similar types of provisions. So we see them there. We see um, arbitration clauses in consumer contracts, like mm -hmm. credit card agreements and things along those lines. Um, disputes many times between investors and securities brokers uh, mm -hmm. may require arbitration. And there's also a fair amount of um, kind of larger scale business uh, disputes that mm -hmm. can also be resolved in this way. So if two good businesses have a uh, disagreement over a, a contract or the provision of the contract, how it's supposed to be interpreted, they, could, they might end up going to arbitration instead of to court. Right, and it's especially helpful in the international context. Now, it, it sounds like in some ways uh, arbitration is doing some of the same things that, uh, that you could through the courts. So what are some of the differences or, or what are some of the advantages for arbitration relative to the courts? Okay. Well, with arbitration, um, you generally have um, a neutral third party. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's one person called an arbitrator. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a panel of three arbitrators. And they basically um, kind of have a hearing, uh, hear from each side in the dispute, and then reach a binding decision that's called an award. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's, uh, this takes place through larger associations. So I know we have our slide over here um, featuring some of the most prominent um, arbitration agencies. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes this can be um, an individual kind of independent um, arbitrator that the parties decide on. But that's really the key point is that the arbitrator or the arbitration agency is selected by the parties. It's just part of their kind of agreement on who should resolve the dispute. So for instance, like in the baseball arbitration, the, the clubs, the, the baseball clubs and then the players union would get together and they would decide, you know, perhaps whatever arbitrator or group of arbitrators they would like to have hear these cases when they arise, right? Sure. And so that decision can be made actually in the contract itself, mm -hmm. or sometimes the contract might just say that the parties are supposed to kind of confer if a dispute comes up and then choose one at that time. So the arbitrator can be chosen by the uh, parties, and, and uh, then you, you would go ahead and have a hearing, right? Right, yes. And, and so what's involved with the hearing, and, and are there differences between what you'd see in an arbitration hearing versus, like, say, through uh, the litigation, uh, both the litigation process and then the, the, the trial itself? Yes, there's, there's some similarities, but quite a few differences. Um, arbitration is definitely less formal. You still mm -hmm. have rules, you still have procedures, but it's just a little bit more streamlined. Things aren't maybe necessarily as rigid. 
Um, you also have limited discovery before the hearing. Um, so all of the kind of pre-hearing um, process is generally a little bit quicker um, mm -hmm. than the pre-trial kind of process. Um, I think probably those would be some of the key differences. Now, uh, when we have these arbitrators, what, what are the, the, the arbitrators' backgrounds? I know they might be working for like the, the American Arbitration Association. What will be the a typical ar arbitrator's background? Arbitrators very, very commonly um, are retired judges or retired mm -hmm. lawyers. Um, generally, they have some kind of experience in the type of legal issue um, in a particular dispute that they're hearing. And then sometimes when you have a panel of arbitrators, you actually have um, one of the members who may not have any legal background at all, but who has specialized, maybe kind of technical experience. And that's okay. commonly used where you have a complicated or complex legal issue. So, um, so what might be an example of, of the case where you'd want to have an expert who, from like the industry? Uh, commodities issues, you see that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. The construction industry, there's a lot of just very issues that are very specific to that industry. So you see that sometimes there too. So you'd have somebody who's worked in construction and so when you like, have a, a dispute probably between like a contractor and, and somebody who's building a, a building and you, you can bring in somebody who actually has real world experience working in there would know how these types of uh, disputes get handled or have seen it come up before, right? Right, definitely. And, and so then when we have the hearing, uh, is there a jury involved with the arbitration or, or who's serving as it, it, the, the jury here? The arbitrator or the panel um, are the, the sole decision makers in the case. So they would make um, questions on uh, legal issues. So that's mm -hmm. normally what a judge would do in a trial. And then they also reach the um, you know, ultimate decision in the case. And that's typically what a jury does in a civil trial and litigation process. So they serve as really both as the judge and the jury in an arbitration hearing. So then it would seem like in litigation you have very strict rules of evidence of, you know, you have to be, be allowed to present certain uh, things during the course of the, the trial for the jury to, to know about this. But it would seem like in the case of arbitration, the arbitrators could ask the, the parties directly about information that would be relevant uh, for the case, right? So things definitely um, in an arbitration hearing are more relaxed. You know, mm -hmm. there are some um, limitations and some kind of, um, some rules kind of like the rules of evidence in trials. And those are usually set by uh, the arbitration agencies, for example. So they do have some um, guidelines on what evidence is relevant and can be presented. Um, but in general, things, just are a little bit more informal as far as the back and forth and the presentation of evidence. And then uh, if you have, you know, in the arbitration hearing, what, what law would be getting enforced here? Would it be like, the general statutes or would it be the specific contract? Uh, can you explain that for us? Well, if, if you do have a contract um, dispute, mm -hmm. then so generally um, law governing contracts is usually an issue of state law. Okay. So the arbitrators are going to need to, um, to research and interpret and apply whatever state law governs the contract. And okay. that could be something that the contract sets itself, um, or it could just be something that choice of law rules would determine, and that mm -hmm. would mean that the arbitrators would actually have to decide which state's law applies and then apply it to the contract. Okay. Of course, then you know the agencies have their own procedures, so those would come into play. Um, possibly the Federal Arbitration Act could come into play. So there's a lot of different sources of law um, that could be relevant. Now, one of the things that is, seems to be an important difference here is that is some of parties aren't forced to arbitrate. Or, or, I mean, if, we, we do have mandatory arbitration clauses and contracts. We will we'll get, get to that, but at some level, I mean. It, two parties wouldn't necessarily have to agree that they, they would use an arbitrator at all. They could use the courts, right? Sure. So as long as you, um, I mean, if we're looking at whether you have the decision to enter into the contract itself mm -hmm. that requires arbitration, sure, of course, just like any other contract, you can always make that decision. And so at some level, the arbitrators sort of have to be competing for their business, uh, to, to have business here. And that is that they have to offer services that parties, you know, the, the businesses and employees or, or business or employee unions or, or that would want to use. 
Right, yeah, and there's, you know, like we showed earlier, there's a fair number um, of different agencies that, mm -hmm. that could be selected, um, and so they do, you know, compete with one another. And if, I guess they could lose that business too, right? If, if you, you uh, agreed to use one arbitrator or a group of arbitrators and weren't happy with their sa uh, performance, I mean, you could always like uh, agree at some future time we're gonna switch and, and use a different uh, arbitration agency, right? Definitely. No. We, the alternative would be through the courts, and uh, that's what people would be more familiar with, the things like uh, juries and, and judges. And so we've already said that like, the arbitrators are serving as both judge and jury. Um, so relative to judges, what are the uh, advantages of, of arbitrators relative to your sort of standard uh, judge? Well, when you do not have um, a case that's being heard in a very specialized court, and there's a mm -hmm. few of those, like bankruptcy courts, um, where that's all the judges do, you know, it would certainly be possible, especially in very, very um, complex types of cases, to have your case, you know, assigned before a judge, and, and definitely have a jury brought in, who may not necessarily have experience in that area of the law. Mm -hmm. Now, a judge's job and, and the lawyer's job you know, the, the whole purpose of the court system is to um, kind of have everybody get, conduct enough research and get to the point where they can reach a decision in the case. But that being said, you know, parties, especially in business disputes, might be more confident knowing that the person deciding their case has significant, you know, history, significant experience in a particular area of the law. And so in that case, um, you know, arbitration might be a really good option because there you can be assured that the person deciding the case is really experienced in that area. And I guess a part of that would stem from the fact that, I mean, the law is very broad. If you're not a, if you're not a lawyer from the outside, you might think, well, <laughs> judges know the law. They, they, they should know all, all the elements of the law. But, I mean, the law is just extremely diverse and, and nobody can know be an expert in all of these different uh, areas of law that might come before a, a, a court. Yes, I mean, I think too, especially just as time goes on um, and really business transactions and just societal interactions become more complex, you also see the law becoming more complicated and definitely specialized. Mm -hmm. um, so you may have a judge who has, you know, maybe been a district attorney or maybe who has practiced, um, you know, totally in, in maybe tort law or something along those lines doesn't have a ton of experience or history dealing with commercial transactions mm -hmm. and so it's it's certainly going to be a learning curve um, and I think I think that's something to be aware of. And by contrast we also said the arbitrator serving as the jury in, in, in you know, making a, a, the award in the arbitration case so that would mean we don't have a, a jury and that's a very different way of, of, I guess, making a decision in a case, right? Yes. Um, and absolutely. jurors are, are drawn from the general population, right? Yeah, so states have basically lists of potential jurors, and these come from DMV records that could come from voting lists, and then pools are drawn from which the jury is selected. But that, as far as who the pool is, that's a pretty, it's kind of a random process right. from those lists. And people might serve on a jury once or twice or not, not all, all the time. Sure, right, absolutely. And, you know, maybe if, if it's your second time serving on a jury, you could have served on a criminal jury before, and, and the jurors have no particular expertise at all uh, on the law, right? Right. And I mean, the judge is supposed to inform them in, uh, about the, the relevant case law and everything, but you don't have like experts who are, are making these decisions uh, in the jury box. Right. It's a very different process. Um, you know, many would argue that there are a lot of advantages you know, to having kind of that almost extreme level of objectivity or being mm -hmm. so neutral because you really don't have any background in the case. And so parties may, you know, feel that that is preferable, but there certainly are um, situations where you would want a higher level of expertise, especially for really complicated types of cases. Mm -hmm. And so that's where arbitration can, can really be an advantage. And so if, if you had like jurors who 
aren't experts in, in the law at all. It's just like the average uh, person you're, you're taking for jury duty. I mean, it would seem like they're more likely to make a mistake in applying the law simply because they're not experts in it, especially relative to an arbitrator who deals just with like, I you know, baseball uh, salary arbitration uh, decisions where you handle like the same type of, of decision all the time, right? I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure as far as how that comparison um, goes, but I can definitely imagine that you know, the parties going into the situation may feel more confident, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the arbitrator's ability to kind of sort, really sort through the issues and apply the law to the facts. And yeah, so do they be more confident that you have a decision that would really reflect like the, the specifics or the details of, of their business? Right. Now, we mentioned before about the, raise the, the issue of well, binding arbitration. And so the, I want to get into the question then. If you have a, a dispute between, uh, say, a landlord and a tenant, a, a consumer and a, their bank, or, or whatever the context, once the award is made, are the parties bound by that award, or can somebody just say, like, oh, I don't like that, the, what the arbitrator said, I'll just go to court anyway? Um, arbitration awards are definitely binding. Um, that's where the Federal Arbitration Act comes in. Mm -hmm. And so when Congress enacted that law, it basically established a nationwide policy that's strongly in favor of enforcing arbitration agreements. Uh, so basically what it allows for um, is that parties who have received an arbitration award can basically um, sort of just file that with a court who will then enter that award as, um, as a court judgment. Mm -hmm. And so then those awards can be enforced kind of through the normal um, enforcement process that you would use just like enforcing um, a judgment entered in a normal court case. So then you've got the judgment against you and it's, it's got the full effect of law, yes. full force of law, right? Right. Now, is, as we compare this then, you mentioned that the, the arbitration process is a little more streamlined, a, a little uh, quicker. I mean, what would be some of the other advantages? Does it end up being like, like less costly if we use arbitration? Well, um, I think that, that that's, a, that's a very strong argument that's commonly made in mm -hmm. favor of arbitration. Now, it's, it's very interesting because that's something that has been just kind of assumed almost without question for years and years just as an advantage of arbitration. It's cheaper, it's cheaper, it's cheaper. But recently there has been a little bit of pushback on that from consumer advocates. Um, I still think it's fair to say that from, from, from what I've seen, um, I do think arbitration probably is a quicker process. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen estimates on the average time that it takes to resolve a case through arbitration. I've seen anywhere from four to five months up to a little over a year. Mm -hmm. But when you take into account the fact that resolving a case through litigation can take years and years, mm -hmm. even in states where, you know, court dockets aren't particularly crowded, um, I think, you know, we can be fairly confident that arbitration is generally faster. Mm -hmm. Now that being said, the faster a case concludes, the less um, you're, you're going to be facing it as far as attorney's fees, and that's right. actually one of the largest litigation expenses. Mm -hmm. So I think probably overall arbitration is more costly but consumer advocates are concerned about some things like um, the cost of actually bringing a case to arbitration mm -hmm. versus filing fees in court. And so there may be some, um, you know, kind of complications there. So we talk about how the, the under in the United States and the Federal Arbitration Act, uh, the court, these uh, decisions can be entered in, in a court of law and they have the same effect as if you, they were a court decision. How about, um, in international business, can you, do uh, international businesses use uh, arbitration as well? Because I mean, there's not necessarily a, a court of justice. I mean, there, there is like the international court of uh, of justice in, in Europe. I mean, for like business uh, business courts, I mean, there, there's not always necessarily a parallel. Uh, how how does, can international arbitration work? So it's really interesting, actually. Um, international um, in international disputes. Arbitration is very commonly uh, favored because it's often easier to enforce an arbitration award um, in, in an international court 
than it is to enforce a judgment from an international court. Okay. And so a large part of that comes from um, a treaty that's called the New York Convention. Mm -hmm. And there are 145 countries who have signed on to this and who have basically agreed to enforce arbitration awards um, in, one another's, in one another's courts. And okay. there's really no um, equivalent of that for um, court judgments. You have, I mean, you still have a few kind of treaties here and there between individual countries, mm -hmm. but as far as a huge multilateral, you know, 145 member country treaty, you just don't see that with judgments. So you actually have a lot more kind of um, confidence as far as you know international disputes in arbitration awards in many cases. So even if you were a U.S. consumer, you're involved with a. a, a a dispute that goes to arbitration with a company from Canada or Germany or another a country, they're likely going to be covered under this uh, convention, right? And, and you're, you're, if you get the arbitration award in your favor, they'll, you'll, you'll be able to enforce that, right? Right. Um, I do think, you know, with international arbitration, we probably see that more in the business to business right. type of disputes. Mm -hmm. um, but I would imagine that, you know, consumers would, would be able to take advantage of that as well. Now, it, that seems kind of fascinating because, in it's, Countries didn't wouldn't have to agree to, to uh, join this New York Convention and, and, and agree to have a international arbitration. Um, but even before we have this, uh, even before one business has to go to the court to enforce that, oftentimes the businesses uh, pretty much abide by arbitrators' decisions, right? Right. I mean, the New York Convention is great, kind of as a backup. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that in the vast majority of cases, the judgment really never has to be enforced through a court system at all. You do generally see compliance with international arbitration awards. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a reflection of the fact that businesses want to continue doing business. And they know that if they develop a reputation for ignoring these types of um, awards and just, and just failing to abide by what the, arbit um, the arbitra arbitration panel or the arbitrator's order, um, you know, they're really going to be facing serious, um, you know, problems with their reputation in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and that seems really fascinating because, I mean, it, but it also is, it has to be good for business in one level because if you and I have businesses and we get into a dispute, I mean, yes, we have a dispute, we need to have that business uh, the dispute resolved, but we also presumably want to keep doing business. Right. And, and you know, the, I guess it would be good to have a system that allows us to resolve that dispute as quickly as we can without focusing on the dispute and letting the dispute grow to the stage where it, it disrupts any potential for us to continue to do business. Yeah, one huge advantage that is commonly um, discussed really with all the forms of alternative dispute resolution is they tend to be a lot better than litigation at helping parties preserve a relationship mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, they're a little bit less adversarial. Um, they're just not kind of, they're just sort of not, um, you just don't see so much conflict, mm -hmm. so they can really be an advantage there too. Because I mean, any two businesses are always going to have the potential to come up with some kind of dispute. It's just right. the nature of, of business or, or life, where you always have disputes, and I mean, it's very important to have a way to resolve those disputes and keep the, the underlying profitable, uh, worthwhile business relation going. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to realize that a lot of these disputes don't come about because someone is intentionally, mm -hmm. you know, trying to go back on their word or break their promises. I mean, a lot of these things just come down to misunderstandings and miscommunications. Mm -hmm. And they are things that, you know, can and often are worked out mm -hmm. um, in a way that lets the parties continue having a relationship in the future. No. We've talked about a lot of the sort of advantages or the, the reasons why people think arbitration is a good thing. There are some folks who've raised, especially recently, some uh, questions or problems with, with arbitration. What are some of the, the problems that uh, some groups have, have uh, raised with uh, arbitration in recent years? So one um, major source of opposition to arbitration clauses um, are, is consumer advocacy mm -hmm. groups. And there's all different um, kinds of these organizations. Some are lawyers, some are non-lawyers. Um, up here we have um, an example here from a recent study of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, who raised you know, some of these objections to arbitration. And, and this was, I think in this case, the arbitration agreements that banks often have for their customers, I think, right? Right, yeah. Um, 
So there's, you know, certainly that context in the banking industry. But again, you know, you see these arbitration clauses in all kinds of consumer Mm -hmm. contracts. Um, If you order a tablet or something on the, um, you know, off of Amazon or BestBuy.com, and it shows up at your house, a lot of times it'll have a, you know, whole list of terms of service, you know, a user agreement in there, and there very well may be an arbitration clause, you know, buried in that. Mm -hmm. Um, The issue that I think consumer advocates have is that these are, frankly, clauses that are in parts of contracts that we we know that virtually no one ever reads. Right. And so to say that, you know, the agreement to give up the right to a jury trial, to give up possibly, you know, rights to pursue class action lawsuits, and to solely, you know, resolve any disputes through arbitration, it, it's a little bit, it's difficult to kind of focus on that voluntary aspect of it if it's probably something that the consumer never saw in the first right. place. And that, that gets into like the, the binding element of arbitration that we, we touched on earlier, but I think we do want to make sure we get clear on. I mean, uh, the, the contracts have these binding arbitration clauses where, you know, if, if you have a dispute with your bank or credit card company, you have agreed that you will only pursue this through arbitration and, and not through litigation. Right. Yeah, that's a really key point to emphasize. As a matter of fact, if you do have a consumer who has signed a contract that contains one of those clauses, if the consumer tries to file a lawsuit and just kind of ignore the arbitration clause, the other party is actually able to ask the court to require um, the case to be pursued through or, through arbitration. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the Federal Arbitration Act as well, is it does make those clauses, um, it does make them binding. And, and this is, a, I think, a pretty a valid cr- uh, criticism to raise about the arbitration process, because a part of the, the great advantages we have is that because the, the parties sort of agree to do it, and you know, that's why they, they would, if, if you and I both are voluntarily and, and, no, and fully informed in, in terms of choosing to go into arbitration, we're going to choose an arbitrator that we both have confidence in. And, and that, I guess, relates to another of the criticisms that, that uh, arbitration in a lot of these cases is quite unfair uh, to consumers, right? Right, yeah. I mean, aside from the fact that, you know, when, when you have consumers who may not even know that the arbitration clause exists, mm-hmm. we certainly can't say that they kind of realistically played a significant role in deciding on, oh, well, we'll go with the American Arbitration Association as opposed to, you know, JAMS or one of the other organizations. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I think it does kind of um, conflict with that agreement that it's something that both parties considered and thought out and felt was advantageous to both of them. So, I mean, a business could slip in a clause saying, like, this <laughs> case will be arbitrated by the big business arbitration or, or organization, which you know, it's always judges in, in favor of the business, and, and at some level, a, a consumer could, would be unaware that they agreed to be have their case arbitrated by an arbitrator that's going to be unfair toward that right? Well, there, um, <laughs> there, there are definitely, you know, I think one really key point to remember is that there definitely are, um, you know, some some you know kind of protections against things like that. Okay. You know, if, if there's anything in a contract that's too too one sided or burdensome to one side. Um, courts can step in and, and rule that those clauses are um, not enforceable mm. for a variety of kind of reasons in contract doctrine, but they are kind of narrow exceptions. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. I think this has been a, a enlightening, I think, an enjoyable conversation to, to bring some light to uh, something that, that remains sort of in the shadows of our, our legal process, the arbitration process. So, th- so thanks for coming on, Laura. Thank you. And thanks for joining us. Join us again next time for another eConversations.